Hello student, welcome to the lecture on economic reforms in India and after this lecture we will be able to learn the following objectives. Explain the features of economic reforms in India. Discuss privatization and liberalization. Explain about globalization and disinvestment. Understand the meaning and functions of money. Discuss the role and functions of Reserve Bank of India. Explain the monetary policy in India. Discuss the role and functions of commercial bank. Managerial Economics Introduction Initially, the government adopted a limited approach of selling a minority stake in public sector enterprises while retaining management control with the government, a policy described as disinvestment to distinguish it from privatization. The liberalization of the Indian economy along with globalization helped the country to step up its GDP growth rate considerably. Economic reforms in India since 1991 India's economic performance in the post-reforms period has many positive features. The average growth rate in the 10-year period from 1992-93 to 2001-2 was around 6.0% which puts India among the fastest growing developing countries in the 1990s. In sharp contrast, growth in the 1990s was accompanied by remarkable external stability despite the East Asian crisis. Poverty also declined significantly in the post-reform period and at a faster rate than in the 1980s according to some studies. India remained among the fastest growing developing countries in the second sub-period because other developing countries also slowed down after the East Asian crisis. But the annual growth of 5.4% was much below the target of 7.5% which the government had set for the period. World economic growth was slower in the second half of the 1990s and that would have had some dampening effect but India's dependence on the world economy is not large enough for this to account for the slowdown. This in turn is often attributed to India's gradualist approach to reform which has meant a frustratingly slow pace of implementation. Economic reforms in India since 1991 Savings, Investment and Fiscal Discipline Fiscal profligacy was seen to have caused the balance of payments crisis in 1991 and a reduction in the fiscal deficit was therefore an urgent priority at the start of the reforms. The combined fiscal deficit of the central and state governments was successfully reduced from 9.4% of GDP in 1990-91 to 7% in both 1991-92 and 1992-93 and the balance of payments crisis was over by 1993. Public savings deteriorated steadily from plus 1.7% of GDP in 1996-97 to minus 1.7% in 2000-2001. This was reflected in a comparable deterioration in the fiscal deficit taking it to 9.6% of GDP in 2000-2001. Total financial savings of households amount to only 11% of GDP. The fiscal deficit effectively preempts about 90% of household financial savings for the government. The growth rate of 6% per year in the post-reforms period was achieved with an average investment rate of around 23% of GDP, accelerating to 8% growth will require a commensurate increase in investment. Growth rates of this magnitude in East Asia were associated with investment rates ranging from 36 to 38%. Economic reforms in India since 1991 Reforms in Industrial and Trade Policy Reforms in Industrial and Trade Policy were a central focus of much of India's reform effort in the early stages. 
industrial policy prior to the reforms was characterized by multiple controls over private investment which limited the areas in which private investors were allowed to operate and often also determined the scale of operations, the location of new investment and even the technology to be used. The industrial structure that evolved under this regime was highly inefficient and needed to be supported by a highly protective trade policy often providing tailor-made protection to each sector of industry. Industrial policy Industrial policy has seen the greatest change with most central government industrial controls being dismantled. The list of industries reserved solely for the public sector which used to cover 18 industries including iron and steel, heavy plant and machinery, telecommunications and telecom equipment, minerals, oil, mining, air transport services and electricity generation and distribution has been drastically reduced to three defense aircrafts and warships, atomic energy generation and railway transport. Private investors require much permission from state governments to start operations like connections to electricity and water supply and environmental clearances. Trade policy Trade policy reform has also made progress, though the pace has been slower than in industrial liberalization. Imports of manufactured consumer goods were completely banned. For capital goods, raw materials and intermediates, certain lists of goods were freely importable. But for most items, where domestic substitutes were being produced, imports were only possible with import licenses. Import licensing was abolished relatively early for capital goods and intermediates which became freely importable in 1993 simultaneously with the switch to a flexible exchange rate regime. Import licensing had been traditionally defended on the grounds that it was necessary to manage the balance of payments, but the shift to a flexible exchange rate enabled the government to argue that any balance of payments impact would be effectively dealt with through exchange rate flexibility. Quantitative restrictions on imports of manufactured consumer goods and agricultural products were finally removed on April 1, 2001, almost exactly 10 years after the reforms began, and that in part because of a ruling by a World Trade Organization dispute panel on a complaint brought by the United States. Economic reforms in India since 1991 Foreign direct investment Liberalizing foreign direct investment was another important part of India's reforms driven by the belief that this would increase the total volume of investment in the economy, improve production technology and increase access to world markets. Procedures for obtaining permission were greatly simplified by listing industries that are eligible for automatic approval up to specified levels of foreign equity 100%, 74% and 51%. Potential foreign investors investing within these limits only need to register with the Reserve Bank of India. Indian companies have upgraded their technology and expanded to more efficient scales of production. Foreign investment in flows increased from virtually nothing in 1991 to about 0.5% of GDP. High levels of protection compared with other countries also explains why foreign direct investment in India has been much more oriented to the protected domestic market rather than using India as a base for export. Inflexibility of the labour market is a major factor reducing India's competitiveness in exports and also producing industrial productivity generally. The increased competition in the goods market has made labour more willing to take reasonable positions because lack of flexibility only leads to firms losing market share. 
the government has recently announced its intention to amend the law and raise the level of employment above which firms have to seek permission for retrenchment from 100 workers at present to 1,000 while simultaneously increasing the scale of retrenchment compensation. Economic reforms in India since 1991 Reforms in Agriculture A common criticism of India's economic reforms is they have been excessively focused on industrial and trade policy, neglecting agriculture, which provides the livelihood of 60% of the population. The reduction of protection to industry and the accompanying depreciation in the exchange rate has tilted relative prices in favour of agriculture and helped agricultural exports. Government price support levels for food grains such as wheat are supposed to be set on the basis of the recommendations of the Commission on Agricultural Costs and Prices, a technical body which is expected to calibrate price support to reasonable levels. Agricultural diversification also calls for radical changes in some outdated laws. The Essential Commodities Act, which empowers state governments to impose restrictions on movement of agricultural products across state and sometimes even district boundaries and to limit the maximum stocks wholesalers and retailers can carry for certain commodities was designed to prevent exploitive traders from diverting local supplies to other areas of scarcity or from hoarding supplies to raise prices. Economic reforms in India since 1991 Infrastructure development Rapid growth in a globalized environment requires a well-functioning infrastructure including specially electric power, road and rail connectivity, telecommunications, air transport and efficient ports. Private investors were expected to produce electricity for sale to the state electricity boards which would control of transmission and distribution. Private investors fearing non-payment by the state electricity boards insisted on arrangements which guaranteed purchase of electricity by state governments backed by additional guarantees from the central government. The results in telecommunications have been much better and this is an important factor underlying India's success in information technology. Two private sector domestic airlines which began operations after the reforms now have more than half the market for domestic air travel. India's road network is extensive, but most of it is low quality and this is a major constraint for interior locations. A few toll roads and bridges in areas of high traffic density have been awarded to the private sector for development. The railways are a potentially important means of freight transportation, but this area is untouched by reforms as yet. Economic reforms in India since 1991 Financial sector reform Reforms in the stock market were accelerated by a stock market scam in 1992 that revealed serious weaknesses in the regulatory mechanism. Reforms implemented include establishment of a statutory regulator, promulgation of rules and regulations governing various types of participants in the capital market and also activities like inside trading and takeover bids, introduction of electronic trading to improve transparency in establishing prices and dematerialization of shares to eliminate the need for physical movement and storage of paper securities. An important recent reform is the withdrawal of the special privileges enjoyed by the Unit Trust of India, a public sector mutual fund, which was the dominant mutual fund investment vehicle when the reforms began. The insurance sector, including pension schemes, was a public sector monopoly at the start of the reforms. The need to open the sector to private insurance companies was recommended by an expert committee in 1994 but there was strong political resistance. 
An independent insurance development and regulatory authority have now been established and 10 new life insurance companies and 6 general insurance companies, many with well-known international insurance companies as partners have started operations. Economic reforms in India since 1991, social sector, development in health and education, India's social indicators at the start of the reforms in 1991 lagged behind the levels achieved in Southeast Asia 20 years earlier when those countries started to grow rapidly. In a research, it was found that central government expenditure on towards social services and rural development increased from 7.6% of total expenditure in 1990-91 to 10.2% in 2000-2001. As a percentage of GDP, these expenditures show a dip in the first two years of the reforms when fiscal stabilization compulsions were dominant, but there is a modest increase thereafter. Closing the social sector gaps between India and other countries in Southeast Asia will require additional expenditure which in turn depends upon improvements in the fiscal position of both the central and state governments. The literacy rate increased from 52% in 1991 to 65% in 2001, a faster increase in the 1990s than in the previous decade and the increase has been particularly high in some of the low literacy states such as Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh and Rajasthan. Privatization Initially, the government adopted a limited approach of selling a minority stake in public sector enterprises while retaining management control with the government, a policy described as disinvestment to distinguish it from privatization. The principal motivation was to mobilize revenue for the budget though there was some expectation that private shareholders would increase the commercial orientation of public sector enterprises. An important recent innovation which may increase public acceptance of privatization is the decision to earmark the proceeds of privatization to finance additional expenditure on social sector development and for retirement of public debt. Privatization is clearly not a permanent source of revenue, but it can help fill critical gaps in the next 5 to 10 years while longer term solutions to the fiscal problem are attempted. Liberalization Prior to 1991, India followed mixed economy approach to economic development. Industries critically important for the economy were retained by the government, it was felt that this would provide necessary resources to undertake development activities in different segments of the economy. Private sector was allowed to establish industries and business but was subject to controls and regulations so that resources and wealth would not get concentrated in a few hands. In case of public sector, the government invested a considerable share of its revenues and started many public sector enterprises. The purpose behind this strategy to eliminate poverty, reduce inequalities in the distribution of income and wealth and achieve economic growth with social justice. Globalization and its impact. India's economy opened up during the early 90s. The policy measures on the domestic front demanded that there was a requirement of multinational organizations to set up their offices here. The direct impact of globalization was directly seen on the GDP of the country, which increased significantly. The liberalization of the Indian economy, along with globalization, helped the country to step up its GDP growth rate considerably. The GDP growth rate picked up instantly from 5.6% in 1990-91 to 77.8% in 1996-97. Globalization has also played a major role 
in generating employment opportunities in India. Disinvestment The new policy of liberalization, privatization and globalization de-emphasize the role of the public sector in the nation's economy. Disinvestment involves the sale of equity and bond capital invested by the government in PSUs. It also implies the sale of government's loan capital in PSUs through securitization. Disinvestment is generally expected to achieve a greater inflow of private capital and the use of private management practices in PSUs as well as enable more effective monitoring of management discipline by the private shareholders. The government has not used the disinvestment proceeds to finance expenditure on capital accounts. That is, the disinvestment policy has resulted in capital consumption rather than generation. Total disinvestment of PSUs would naturally concentrate economic and political power in the hands of the private corporate sector. The US economist Kenneth Galbraith had visualized a role of countervailing power for the PSUs. Money Money is a token or item which acts as a medium of exchange that has both legal and social acceptance with regards to making payment for buying commodities or receiving services as well as repayment of loans. In addition, money also functions as a standard of value and a store of value because with the help of money, the value of various goods and services can be measured. According to a small number of economists, money is a standard of deferred payment. Money refers both to currency, specifically a large number of currencies that circulate under the legal tender status and different types of financial deposit accounts, for example, savings account, demand deposits, as well as certificates of deposit. According to the theory of modern economy, currency is the most minuscule constituent of money supply. Money has no similarities with real value as real value is the fundamental component of the study of economics. The study of economics has a key focus on money and money is mostly associated with finance. Money – Characteristics of money Money is a medium of exchange or it functions as an intermediary of trade. Money functions as a unit of account or a standard mathematical unit of measurement which is used to measure the market value of various commodities and services and other dealings. Money functions as a store of value because the forms of money can be stored and recovered and used for any future purpose. Money has the highest degree of liquidity for the simple reason that money has the universal acceptance and recognition as the basic form of currency. Money – Functions of Money Money as a unit of value The first function of money is to be a unit of value or a unit of account. The monetary unit is the unit in terms of which the value of all goods and services is measured and expressed. Accounting is simplified as all items will be recorded in terms of monetary units that can be added and subtracted. Money is a useful measuring rod of value only if the value of money itself remains constant. The value of money is linked to its purchasing power. Purchasing power is the inverse of the average or general level of prices as measured by the consumer price index etc. As the general price level increases, a unit of money can purchase a lesser amount of goods and services. So the value or purchasing power of money declines. Money will be a useful unit of value only as long as its own value or purchasing power remains constant. Money as a medium of exchange. Money also acts as a medium of exchange or as a medium of payments. 
this function of money is served by anything that is generally accepted by people in exchange for goods and services. Anything has been quite a variety of things across places and times. Money will then reduce the time and energy spent in barter. All trade may be considered barter. One good or service is traded for another good or services either directly or indirectly with money acting as the intermediary. By acting as an intermediary, money increases the ease of trade. Money is also called a bearer of options or generalized purchasing power. This indicates the freedom of choice that the use of money offers. Money as a standard of deferred payments. Money performs the previous two functions then it may also perform the function of being the unit in terms of which deferred or future payments are stated. As long as money maintains a constant value through time, it will overcome the problems associated with making future payments with specific commodities. Money as a store of value. Money becomes a unit of value and a means of payment then it may also perform the function of serving as a store of value. The holders of money are holders of generalized purchasing power that can be spent through time. It may be noted that any asset other than money may also perform the function of store of value. For example, bonds, land, houses, etc. These assets have the advantage that unlike money, they yield income and may appreciate in value over time. They may involve storage costs. They may not be liquid in the sense that they could not be quickly converted into money without loss of value and they may depreciate in value. A person may choose to store value in any form depending on considerations of income, safety and liquidity. Banking Reserve Bank of India, RBI Banking is defined as the accepting for the purpose of lending or investment of deposits, money from the public, repayable on demand and withdrawable by checks, drafts and orders or otherwise. The central bank of the country is the Reserve Bank of India, RBI. It was established in April 1935 with a share capital of INR 5 crores on the basis of the recommendations of the Hilton Young Commission. Reserve Bank of India was nationalized in the year 1949. The general superintendence and direction of the bank is entrusted to central board of directors of 20 members. The governor and four deputy governors, one government official from the Ministry of Finance, 10 nominated directors by the government to give representation to important elements in the economic life of the country and 4 nominated directors by the central government to represent the 4 local boards with the headquarters at Mumbai, Kolkata, Chennai and New Delhi. The Reserve Bank of India Act 1934 was commenced on April 1, 1935. The Act 1934, 2nd of 1934, provides the statutory basis of the functioning of the bank. The bank was constituted for the need of the following. To regulate the issue of bank notes. To maintain reserves with a view to securing monetary stability and to operate the credit and currency system of the country to its advantage. Banking, Role and Functions of Reserve Bank of India of Piani Group of Colleges welcomes you in this special lecture. My topic for today's discussion is the RBI as a monetary authority. I would discuss this whole chapter in three parts. One is meaning and another is objectives and third one is tools. So far as the meaning is concerned, I would like to make it very clear that the basic policy of the monetary authority as Reserve Bank of India does is making available adequate money for growth and development. Reserve Bank also decides cost of money and credit. 
and based on this it announces its monetary policy for announcing monetary policy reserve bank of india undertakes review of the economy quarterly and in each quarter mid quarterly review and this way reserve bank of india undertakes eight banking functions of commercial banks accepting deposits the most significant and traditional function of commercial bank is accepting deposit from the public savings deposits are paid a small rate of interest and the bank imposes certain restrictions on the withdrawal of money fixed deposits are made by the persons who have idle money with them they can withdraw their money only after the expiry of the fixed period of time providing loans banks provide loans against approved securities to the public and companies loans can be granted in the form of cash credit short term loan overdraft discounting of bills and demand loans credit creation a bank can be called the factory or the manufacturer of the credit in the process of accepting and depositing money banks multiply credit in the economy it depends on cash reserve ratio transfer of funds commercial banks can transfer funds of a customer to other customers accounts in the same or the different bank through checks drafts mail transfers telegraphic transfers etc agency functions collection of bills drafts etc collection of interest dividends etc on behalf of the customers payment of interests installment of loans insurance premium etc purchase and sale of securities banks also execute the will of their customers after their debts other functions payment of credit letters and traveler checks gift checks bank draft etc banks also provide locker services for the valuable security of their customer and charges a very nominal fee banks also deal in foreign exchange such banks are usually called foreign exchange banks summary reforms in industrial and trade policy were a central focus of much of india's reform effort in the early stages the central government's effort must be directed primarily towards improving revenues because performance in this area has deteriorated significantly in the post reform period industrial policy has seen the greatest change with most central government industrial controls being dismantled rapid growth in a globalized environment requires a well functioning infrastructure including specially electric power road and rail connectivity telecommunications air transport and efficient ports india's road network is extensive but most of it is low quality and this is a major constraint for interior locations india's reform program included wide ranging reforms in the banking system and the capital markets relatively early in the process with reforms in insurance introduced at a later stage a bank can be called the factory or the manufacturer of the credit in the process of accepting and depositing money banks multiply credit in the economy it depends on cash reserve ratio